And now I'm going to introduce No Talk again in English because that's his native language. And Noel is a really clever guy. That's what I know. And he is working for Human Made. And Human Made are the cool guys that are supporting the after party. So I'm expecting cool things from you, Noel. Thank you for the introduction. Well appreciated. Who is coming to the after party, by the way? Yeah, awesome. So well, that's going to be a good time. Um, let's see if this works. Yeah, cool. So my name is Noel, um, as Petya said. Uh, and it's good to be back. This is my third time speaking in Sofia. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Swiss, a bit of a nomad, so I bounce around the world. Um, and I'm also a partner at Human Made. Uh, Human Made is an agency. Um, we're about 30 people now or so. Uh, we're a WordPress.com VIP partner, which in other words means we do a lot of uh, enterprise agency or enterprise sort of large scale WordPress. So we have a lot of fun with that, with like Airbnb, Skype, USA Today, uh, pretty good names. On top of that, we, we have a lot of projects, a lot of products that we work on. Um, and that's also why you know, I came to this, to this subject for today. Uh, one, of the, one of the projects we work on where we're a technology partner is a startup in Scandinavia called United Influencers. Um, so that's a blog network of about 150 bloggers. Uh, and at the beginning of the year, there was no traffic. And uh, today, it's the most popular blog network in Scandinavia. Um, when I checked this morning, there were 4,200 people on the site, um, which is pretty good. Uh, so that's something where we, you know, we're, we're part of content strategy. We're contributing to product, um, and uh, you know, just trying to, to think along. Um, another thing is Happy Table that we built, right? It's a platform for um, restaurants to build their own websites. We're pivoting this. But again, B2B uh, content strategy, so again, very relevant to us. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we've also uh, recently built uh, Nomad Base, uh, which is like a real-time map of digital nomads. So it's pretty cool. You know, you can see all the check-ins, like um, basically auto-updates from Swarm, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook automatically and puts us all on the map, which is really fun. Um, so with, with all these products, you know, the, the question of social keeps coming up, right? Uh, what should we do? What should our social strategy be? Uh, how should we position ourselves? And, and typically, what, what I see people do is um, default to strategies that, that are quite traditional, I guess. They, you could take that strategy and apply it to almost any company, right? It, it could be a blueprint that you could just apply to anything. Um, and that's a, the, the traditional sort of way of looking at these things. Um, it, it sort of looks like this, right? Where you have your piece of content. Um, and. It's obviously self-hosted, right? Because it's WordPress, and we believe in owning our own data and owning our content. So we keep everything on our website. And what pe people traditionally do is, you know, they have a couple of social media outlets, Twitter, Facebook, and whatever, and they try to push people to, to their content. The problem with that is the web has changed. We as users are insanely time poor, right? We have notification uh, fatigue. We have too many apps. Um, does anybody here not have enough social media accounts? Is anybody looking for more social media accounts? No? OK, good. Uh, so this is exactly the problem we're running into, right? Um, and it, you, know, you know, we've become more reactive to content as opposed to being proactive. Uh, I used to have bookmarks and RSS feeds and, and, and all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, and now I, I just don't have those things. You know, I've, uh, uh, we as, as users average you know, 28 App, uh, apps per month in terms of what we open, 85% uh, of which is between four or five apps. And I'm guessing those four or five apps have a social element to them. Um, so, so what's happening is that we're discovering content and also consuming that sort of content on, on, a, on, a, on a much higher level than previously. We're on this, 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 this social level, right? So instead of this, what we're looking at today is more something like that. Right? Whereby content is decentralized. We're, we're moving in, into this era where, where the social media isn't about lead generation anymore. Right? It's, it's about um, also producing content there and letting it live there. Um, and by doing this, 
we're respecting the user, right? Because the, the user, um, because we're so time poor and because we have a, a different way of behaving on the net than we did before, we, we a lot of the time just stay on that sort of higher level, right? We don't, we don't dig down into other websites. Um, and, and this is, this is what's, what's really interesting about content strategy today and, and going forward is that how are we going to be able to adapt to that? Um, so let's look at examples. Um, there's a lot of really cool examples out there uh, today. And, and the first that I like to look at is um, National Geographic. Uh, absolutely fascinating company. You know, like years ago, you, you always see like these National Geographic magazines with the, the sort of tears, and you know they, they stick around these these offices or whatever. And now the online platform has grown insanely to the point that, and this this data is a year old, um, and it's incredible. You can actually see it because the screen's so big. Um, but they're dominating across all social channels when it comes to other magazines. Right, so other magazines are online and are trying to to to, to cultivate this social presence um, are are just way behind. And th the most interesting metric here is actually Instagram. Um, so they're at 8.6 million, and the next one, Vogue, is at 2.8 million. So they have a 3x advantage over the next uh, competitor. 3x, and they don't have that anywhere else. Um, so if we look at the actual account today, did you guys spot the difference? National Geographic a year ago, 8.6 million followers. How many today? 34 million. How, do, how the hell does that happen? You know, like it's, it, it's, it, it's incredible. Um, so besides the actual Instagram account itself, this is the most popular corporate or company account that exists on Instagram today. Nike is behind at 26 million followers or so. Um, so here we have National Geographic. Let's, let, let's look at one of the posts. So what do we have here? Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of, lot of things going on here. Um, and off the bat, if, you know, if you're doing this sort of traditional social media, you, you, you may write something like, Oh, there's a, what is the, the man with the leaf hiding, you know, or uh, click here and go to our website and find out, you know, this sort of like weird sort of clickbait kind of stuff. Uh, but instead, we're, we're, we're getting a completely different picture here. So let, let's break it down. Um, Nat Geo, photo taken by Steve McCurry official. First thing, they're linking out to an influencer, right? So uh, National Geographic uses photographers from all around the world. These photographers already have prominent Instagram accounts because they are photographers, so Instagram works well. Um, but they're linking out to them. And then comes the story. I visited Sri Lanka during the monsoon season and caught this picture of a man on an elephant with an umbrella and a man walking who is using a large leaf to protect himself from the rain. The Sri Lankan elephant, a subspecies of Asian elephants, are native to Sri Lanka. Since fewer than 10% of males have tusks, poaching is not the threat it is in other countries. Elephants have been an integral, integral part of this culture for the last two millennia. And also at the bottom, check out our current project in Afghanistan, Imagine Asia. So what's going on here? We have an image, and we also have a description. And together, they create a story. The story hasn't been written by someone who's just a, a copywriter or someone that's a social media expert in some office in New York. This story has been written by uh, the actual photographer. So this is so all of a sudden, we're seeing Instagram turning into essentially what is a microblogging platform, right? It's 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 it's, it's a vehicle for storytelling, which is which is an incre incredible in itself. The other parts to it, obviously, you know, they're, they're respecting the photographer, so they're allowing the photographer to, to also link out to their own projects. Um, but the interesting thing here is those links are within the application, right? So we're not forcing the user to move outside of Instagram. We're not saying, hey, you know, like you're, you're, in, you're in your little app experience now, and now you have to click outbound and go to some Safari site or open a different application. No, it's staying within this application, which is really, really cool. Another example, Vox, uh, absolutely incredible. 
Um, so for those of you who don't know Vox, Vox is uh, a, a platform that helps explain the news. That's kind of the pitch. So instead of having dramatic headlines that um, get really, really old and tiresome after a while, um, they have this, I guess, more Wikipedia st sort of style to explaining the current news in the world. So uh, conflict in Syria, uh, instead of you know, being this, this, this crazy story every day, um, it's, it's more um, w you know, what happened, why are we here, who are the key players, what are different thoughts, right? So it explains both sides, um, and so on and so forth. Now these guys started last year, so over a year ago, and they are now worth over a billion dollars. Uh, they took a $200 million investment from NBC over the summer. What are these guys doing? This is Facebook. Um, you guys recognize him. He's Bernie Sanders, right? He's one of the presidential candidates uh, in the U.S. right now. Um, so this is, this, is, this is massive real estate, right, in terms of value. Uh, th this sort of video, uh, if you have an interview with a presidential candidate, is, is, is worth a lot. Uh, traditional content strategy would tell you to put it on your website, uh, put a lot of ads around that website, monetize it, uh, put teasers onto Facebook, Twitter, and all these different websites, and say, hey, check out the, check out the, you know, the video we have on Bernie Sanders. Um, so this, this, could, this would be exactly the same case here. Right? It'd be a teaser, and it links out. The one thing you'll notice here, though, is that this video is two minutes and four seconds. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's cut together. It's not 10 seconds. It's not a teaser. It's, it's, the, it's the actual content. Right? So they're, they're respecting the user experience and saying, here's the content. And what's that materializing into? Shares, comments, likes. Uh, people are able to, to pass it on and consume it. And then over time, also trust Vox, which is why Vox has a massive following today, despite only being a year old. Uh, so, so far, when I've talked about this, this sort of you know, publishing and content strategy, it's, it's been around social media. But another great thing that Vox does is Vox sentences. Right? So email is a channel. It's, it's a channel, right? Um, I, I check my email every morning, and I, I, I don't want to click out on, on links. I want to be able to process my email uh, in one go. The Vox sentences email uh, picks out three to four issues, and then for all of those issues, picks out the best articles that were written on that. Part of them are from Vox, part of them from other uh, sources. But it also explains the different viewpoints for any particular issue. This is the only, read, uh, the only news I read today. I've, I haven't read news for three or four years, and now uh, I read the news every morning uh, through, through this email. Right? Um, and it's because they're adding this, this layer of value by, by curating this different content and creating one or two sentences to explain the article that they're linking out to. Um, it, it's fascinating. Um, so if you don't have access to you know, a, a photographer in the Amazon or in Antarctica, or you don't have access to a presidential candidate, you also want to be able to you know, st still understand how to create a, a, a strategy that works for you too, right? Or even for myself. You know, these are questions I'm asking myself. Um, BuzzFeed, you know, another great example. Uh, they also took a uh, $200 million investment from NBC over the summer, um, so pretty significant. They've also gained or uh, you know, benefited a lot from bringing up the content to a, a different layer, uh, so bringing that up to where we discover it. So let's look at an example. Um, BuzzFeed Food is a subset right, of BuzzFeed. Uh, so this is just a small account. Um, snack Champions. Right, so right off the bat, we know this is like quick food, um, easy stuff. Show us delicious th uh, things with the hashtag BuzzFeast for a chance to be featured. Pretty straightforward. So I went, I went scanning through the, through the history, and I found this picture. Uh, at Christine Byrne, made a frickin' grilled cheese and cut a frickin' hole in it and dropped a frickin' egg in it. Sounds very American, right? Um, but yeah, it took off. Everything went well. So basically, the, the person who took that picture is, is being, you know, is being mentioned, is being tagged. Uh, that's all well and good. But what happened a few weeks later after this? This is where it gets really cool. So a few weeks ago, Christine Byrne made a grilled cheese with an egg in the middle, and you guys liked it so much that she's here to show you how to make it. So let's see how to make it. This is really great. Oh. 
Okay. How many people are confident they can make this now? <laughs> Fucking hell, isn't that incredible? You guys learned this in 15 seconds. Because that's all a video on Instagram can be. So, so when you think about like other recipe sites, like, um, like allrecipes.com, Food Network, and all these other places, it's like, you know, th th there's a picture of the final product, and there's all this text, right? And, and it takes you way more than 15 seconds to get there, because you're clicking in there, you're, you're kind of trying to scan stuff and everything. And all of a sudden, you have the entire content piece, the entire story, everything together in one post on Instagram, right? It's mind-blowing. It's an, when, when you consider something like All Recipes or these other sites, um, a lot of that depends on you actually reading, you know, the text. This, for, for, for all we know, is actually multilingual at this point, right? Because everybody kind of gets it. Um, so it's, it, it's self-contained, it works, um, and it's, it's incredible to, to be able to see um, Instagram used in that sort of fashion, right? Um, just another quick example on BuzzFeed Food. Um, this, was, this was posted um, yesterday. Um, Again, another example where you know someone used that hashtag BuzzFeast, uh, and then that person was also uh, tagged inside the post uh, at the Sweet Life of Lena. Um, so I had a quick look at her account, uh, you know, through analytics to see, hey, what was the impact of this? Um, so it turns out, you know, she gained a lot of followers off that, right? Which is pretty cool. Um, but not only did she gain followers, but she also um, got influential followers, right? So people with, with you know, pretty significant accounts. So a lot of people are winning here, right? So BuzzFeed Food uh, is able to, to promote content. Um, we have at Christine Byrne, which was uh, the previous one, and we have this uh, at um, the Sweet Life of Lena. Uh, all three people only created content on Instagram. It was distributed through Instagram. It was all about food, and it never left Instagram. It's mind-blowing. Uh, and and this, is, this is where content is being consumed today. So what's, what's the future of all of this? Uh, or where is this going? How is this you know, going further? Um, one of the most interesting things that ha has come out lately is Apple News. Um, that's it's quite significant. Um, we, we did see uh, a couple weeks back, well, more than a couple weeks back, how um, Apple now allows ad blockers, right? How many people have ad blockers on their Safari on iPhone? Right, like a lot of, a lot of you guys. Um, Apple News obviously does not get blocked in any way, shape, or form because that's the play, right? Um, so Apple News is an app, right? It's, it, it, it's, it's a modern RSS reader, uh, but it, it comes pre-installed with everything if you have an iPad. Uh, and it's soon coming to iPhone and all that good stuff. So what's happening with Apple News? You get, that, you get to pick out the publications you like to follow. Um, and also, and this is, this is really, really important, you also get to, to pick out certain uh, interests. So you can see here, you can pick out certain interests that you want to follow. This is, this, is, this is a massive part of content publishing and sort of content strategy going forward, is that a lot of the discovery that's going to go on is interest driven as opposed to, oh, I'm just going to go you know, find my, my favorite author on a couple subjects. But rather, you're, you're, you're going to be following on websites you've never seen before. That's how a, a lot of my browsing goes on today. Um, but to make, the, to make this short, um, you pick out your interests, you pick out the publications you like. These things get put together in a single feed, um, and then you get to read the articles. Nothing revolutionary here, right? This, the technology isn't mind-blowing in any way, but it's about distribution. So this, this comes pre-installed. Everybody has access to it. I've already played with it. I already use it now on my iPad. It works. It's good. Um, and the, the ad money that's going to be made off this is going to be split with publishers. Right, so it is actually interesting because uh, chances are, because there, there's, a, there's a certain degree of being interest driven, you're going to find new readers uh, or a new audience for the publications that you manage, um, which, which is really interesting and obviously creates a, a new source of revenue for you. Um, so I think Apple News is interesting and good and I, I guess a step in the right direction, but Facebook seems to have gone a big step further uh, with Facebook Instant Articles, which is only available in the U.S. right now. Um, and you know, with both Apple News and Facebook, you know, guess who the, the launch partners are? National Geographic, Vox, BuzzFeed, uh, New York Times, 
The Atlantic, all these kind of you know major publications that understand uh, how to push content on a very social level. So let's let's look at the the, the Facebook one. Uh, and again, keep in mind this is you're not having to create any content on the actual uh, Facebook level, so you don't have to replicate your content. This is still an RSS feed, right? So uh, yes, you're upmarking your HTML to add certain other properties to it. Uh, and, and so on, but uh, ultimately, it, it's, it's the same content, which is absolutely mind blowing because who would not want to experience content like this, right? Um, so it's always the same, it, 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 it's geared towards your interests again, right? So uh, a lot of people are playing towards this Apple News, Facebook, uh, Twitter. So Twitter is coming out with Moments, right, which is an interest driven uh, or event driven uh, timeline. Uh, because right now Twitter is still very much geared towards power users when it comes to discovery and interests. Um, even Google and Twitter together are trying to come up with something. Um, so there's there's a lot of lot of this this stuff going on, which is absolutely fa uh, fascinating. I think that the big scare for a lot of us is obviously we've we've been publishing on WordPress for so long, uh, and we want to be able to hold on to our content, right? We want to be able to say this is our content, I own it. It doesn't quite work like that anymore if you want distribution, right? Um, yes, you can, you can self-publish all day and um, get buried deeper in this sort of stack of, you know, how do people find your content? Um, or you can have sort of embrace it, uh, take a couple risks, and, and, you know, decentralize your content uh, amongst different places. Um, so, for instance, I write between my own blog, but also medium.com, because medium, uh, because of the recommendation engine there, uh, allows me to 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 find uh, n new audiences that would like to read my stuff and then follow me. Um, so it's it's you're you're trading up a certain degree of freedom for uh, a certain amount of traffic or or uh, or contributing to your brand. Um, so going forward, content publishing. There's there's a couple of things I see, um, and if if you want to position yourselves really well for this kind of stuff. Um, th these are, this is my advice. The first is tell stories, don't tease, right? So d don't do the clickbait stuff. Don't, you know, don't, don't, try to, don't try to force people to click away from uh, the app experience they're in right now. So let's say they're in Facebook uh, or they're in Twitter or they're in uh, Instagram, wherever it is, don't try to push them away from it. Tell the entire story there, like you saw with National Geographic. That was a self-contained story. It was like a microblog, right? Creative problem solving. Um, so we we saw with the the, the, the food uh, time lapse how you could put together an entire recipe that you guys probably still remember right now how to do uh, in 15 seconds. So it, it's a restrictive format. How do you come up with ways that are creative? and are able to communicate your entire story or piece of content in one go. And last but not least, this is the, this is the, this is the main point of this talk, is that content, to a very large level, is being consumed at the point where it's being discovered. This is, this is crucial, um, and this is something that we really have to uh, embrace if we want to be able to um, manage products or you know, projects or you know, our websites and, and push them further. In a, in a sustainable way, uh, not these, you know, these regular social media st uh, tactics that we see. So with that said, um, I wish you guys all the best of luck with whatever content publishing goals you may have this year and sort of social strategy. Um, yeah, thank you. So anybody have a question for Noel? Hi, thank you for your talk, first of all. Secondly, uh, my question is exactly how do you maximize the content that you do write in your blog, and how do you connect that with the content that you post on other sites? What do you mean by maximize content, sorry? Uh, more like optimize, I guess I would say. How do you uh, write it? How do you put it together so that it's connected with the other content that you're putting? Do you post the same thing? Do you refer to it? If not oh, man, I'm really bad at that. So, <laughs> so the, the thing is, like, I... Uh, 
in terms of like, so where, when I write, it's it, it's my own. It's uh, it's under the Noel brand, if you want, right? And the Noel brand is is a couple things. It's WordPress. Uh, it's the digital nomad stuff. It's maybe a bit of product and startup stuff. So it, it, it's hard to optimize. Um, I definitely do try to categorize things a bit better. Um, so like when I'm on Medium and I write on Medium, um, I'm able to to you know to push. Uh, a certain article into a certain publication, so that's part of a, a group like the Digital Nomad stuff. Um, but in terms of optimizing content, that's, I mean, you really have to find your focus, you know, like it's, it's, it's really tough to, and, and I'm finding myself in this, in this situation now with like my own blog, you know, I have all these different themes and they're kind of disconnected, they don't fit together. Um, and I don't have like a massive overwhelming amount of content that I could just create a, 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 a subsection for each. Um, so it's, it's, it's defi we're, we're definitely entering this sort of era where you have to have this sort of laser focus on something you want to curate content for. I mean, you look at like Instagram accounts, like the, the most popular ones have a very large degree of consistency, right? So they, they, they always have the, the same filters, the same look, the same crops, the same sort of motives. Um, let's say we're United Influencers, right? We're the blog network we manage. Uh, we notice that whenever someone like a cooking blogger writes about like lifestyle or something like that, uh, or posts about lifestyle or posts about their children, the likes go right down the drain, right? Like there's there's, there's no likes because people follow them for a very specific um, focus on 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 or, or niche, right? Um, and that's I, I I guess it's it, it really comes down to when you are creating content these days. You know, understand really, really well what niche you want to target, and you know, just punch through for content on that level. But whenever you, you come up with a, a different sort of uh, theme or something you'd like to write about, then find another way to distribute it, maybe, or even create a different account for it. Uh, it's a tough question to answer off the bat. <laughs> questions, questions. You guys gonna let me get away like this? That's really easy. Don't let him go. Come on. <laughs> here we go. I've got a troublemaker down here. Hey, no. Um, I want to ask you about monetizing. What happens to monetizing content when you distribute to like all the channels and like actually provide the content? And what's your um, observation? and uh, how companies that actually do do that are able to kind of keep their uh, profits? Because yeah, good question. Um, so it, it depends on the channel, uh, well, not the channel, but rather like the, the type of business. Um, Vox, like let's say Vox, right, like massive media site, um, they, they advertise inside the Vox sentences, they advertise inside of, um, inside of the website, obviously. Uh, and because of the reputation that they're generating through one or two channels, they're able to bring a lot of users to the other channels that they monetize. So it, part of it could be put under this umbrella, considered the long game, right? Um, so that works out extremely well for them. When you're looking at someone that's more traditional, like the bloggers we have at United Influencers, um, then in that case, typically they'll, they'll, they'll create like five or six pieces of content uh, on any channel, and then the, the, you know the, the six, seven, four, eight, or whatever sort of piece is then sponsored, right? So uh, they might do like uh, a, a Snapchat that's sponsored uh, every two, three days. They may do an Instagram post that's sponsored every, you know, like six, seven posts or something like that. Uh, and in that regard, they're able to then monetize, but still, still create content without being too pushy. Can I uh, just ask a small follow-up? Uh, when they publish sponsored content, is that marked as a sponsored content uh, in the case of United Influencers? Uh, depends on the, the legality of the country. All right. So in the case of Norway, that's heavily sponsored, uh, heavily regulated. Um, so that has to be extremely clearly marked on post. Uh, it has to be verbally mentioned inside of a Snapchat. Um, on the Instagram, it's 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 set at the bottom. This is a sponsored uh, post, um, and we adhere to that. Obviously, uh, right. it's also beneficial to the end user that they know that they're not being you know tricked or duped into some kind of product. Definitely, thank you. Pleasure. 
comme Imo. Oui, je reste. Are you not worried that such services that aggregate news may bring you targeted content and uh, left out some important content, like political stuff that uh, may be important to you, but you then don't receive them? So like, you mean like Apple News and like Facebook, it's in articles, right? Yeah, and Vox too. Yeah. Um, Vox, I, I think Vo for like something like Vox, that's, that's part of their... That that's part of their uh, value proposition is that they're unbiased and they, they try to you know be widespread. But something on like Facebook or Apple News, um, I think money talks. So to to a large extent, um, you're either going to get um, very popular content for for an interest that you have, or you're going to get sponsored content that's targeted based on your demographic, right? Yes, but this can uh, influence some political changes and some political opinions. <laughs> Well, if you understand me. Yeah, yeah, but, but that's, that's, I mean, I, I guess that's how, that's how distribution works and how the, the sort of monopolization of certain channels online works. I mean, Facebook is here and it's not going anywhere, so we're kind of a slave to it. Yeah, maybe that is why we should need to uh, read more books and not uh, rely on such services. <laughs> That's 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 a that's a parenting job, I guess, more than my job. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. And I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree that filming food up close or picturing it is the best successful strategy for content? <laughs> filming it up close? Yeah, like really close. <laughs> is is this a trick question? No, <laughs> it's actually a really real okay. question. Okay, so. Um, when, when I'm preparing slides and I'm really hungry and I, I go on a BuzzFeed account and I see that, yeah, it works. Like, so I think it's, it's extremely successful um, because I ordered food right after creating the slides. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the, the way that they've, they've done it, I, I think we're going to see more and more creative ways to create these sort of time lapses, um, work with limits like 15 seconds. Uh, work with limits like small screens, uh, so having to magnify food up close and you know be able to produce content like that. Thank you. So anybody else? And yeah, please, yeah, could this here. be the last question? Thank you. There's two actually. <laughs> two. Okay. Hey, um, I'm just wondering, what's the best way to grow your influencers, like your likes and your followers, through your own content or the channels, or maybe you can tell some about the the ones in the future that we can use. Um, what's, what's, your, what's your goal? Like, what, what's, what's your business? It's a, it's a product. It's okay, a, product. It's a product, yeah, it's a business. And maybe in that niche, I should focus on that one? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, there, there, there's two aspects to it. Uh, best way to grow it, put out original content, right? Um, be able to distribute that original content in ways that fit the format of the channels you're distributing to. Kind of like the examples I, I showed. Um, the other part to it is that followers and, and likes and comments, these sort of metrics are, are more or less like vanity metrics, right? Like, you know, like if, if you get 80 likes, you're not going to get 80 more sales, right? So like the, the ultimate sort of metric you're looking for is how, much, how many people are buying my stuff, how many people are signing up for my product, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So when I wrote a, a, an article the other day on Medium called Nomad and Flow to promote Nomad Base, I was looking at signups on, um, on Nomad Base, and, and that worked out great. But everything in between doesn't matter because that's kind of a vanity metric, right? So, um, original content. Uh, I have two questions. First is, how do you choose what content to put in a social network? I mean, for example, the National Geographic photo, do they put it only on Instagram on the, or they spam it on all the networks? And the second question is, what do you think of banner advertising as a monetization method? Yeah, good questions, really good questions. Um, so the first one, um, National Geographic does an extremely good job of doing this sort of organic growth, very nice touchy-feely on Instagram, right? Beautiful pictures, stories, uh, microblogging if you want, no promotional stuff. You go on their Facebook page, it's all outbound links to National Geographic, right? So they're, they're, they're they're growing their, their, their social following through something like Instagram. A lot of that's transferring over to Facebook, and 
there, it's kind of like a shotgun approach, right? Where they, they post like six times a day uh, to, to different products, TV shows they're running or whatever. And that's their hope of sort of converting some of that in traffic. So one's coming in organically and then being fed through to Facebook and then going out as, as a form of lead generation. So lead generation still stays, right? Um, and then the, the second question about um, banner ads. Um, yes, banner ads are cool. Um, well, I mean, we, we've known about ad blindness before. We, we knew about ad blindness in the 90s already, right? The term already came up ages ago. Um, but, but now the, 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 there's, it, there seems to be a bit of a push towards um, not click-throughs, but rather just awareness. So uh, in-screen time. So knowing how long uh, a banner stays inside of a website uh, or in, inside of a view. Um, that's being extrapolated further to, to, to be more sponsored content, right? So instead of having banner ads, you have content that's sponsored by certain people. So if you look at Medium, um, th there's a Matter series that was sponsored by BMW. Not a banner ad, but it could have been the same thing because it just said sponsored by BMW. Look at the New York Times now, you'll find articles sponsored by Airbnb, right? Um, so it, it's that, that, that brand relation to content on your own site, it still exists. It's just taking different forms now, and there's different engagement metrics that are uh, that are being used for monetization. Rock and roll. Let's rock and roll. Okay. Thank you, Noah. Pleasure.